So anyway, I got this new driver's license. How many people got the new driver's license? Put up your hand if you got the new one. Okay, okay, so um, how many people now, a little more survey on driver's licenses, how many people do not smile? Smile in many pictures in many places, but when you get your driver's license, do not smile. Put up your hand if you don't smile on your driver's license thing. If you're just kind of like, close up on me, close up on me, if you're just kind of like, <laughs> you know, kind of, wait, 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 kind of. I got, think, I got thinking about that, you know, uh, why don't I smile on my driver's license thing? And um, I figured it out. It's because of who looks at my driver's license. <laughs> Sir, may I have your license, please? <laughs> so I'm not in a super mood when I got to pass my license out the driver's window, right? And, and uh, then those guys I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the TSA people, they want to see your driver's license now. So n- that's not a great process. Don't want to smile at them. And, and uh, then, now it's a big thing if you give your credit card at the store, like it's not enough anymore just to match the uh, signature on the back. Now a lot of times when you want to buy something, they want to see your what? Driver's license. So that's why I don't smile on my driver's license. But then anyway, so this driver's license, if you have a, how many people don't have the new one yet? Put up your hand if you don't have the new one. Are you kidding? <laughs> this is so cool because when you're going through the airport now, it's got all this like really high tech, cool stuff in close up on my driver's license, all this high tech cool stuff in here, and they flash a light on it, and they got to make sure if it's all, I'm sure it's just like a higher level of security. Apparently, some places on your driver's license, apparently, they have uh, embedded uh, certain pieces of information uh, to determine uh, if it's authentically yours. Let's call them uh, marks. Let's say there's some marks on your driver's license that are embedded there. You can't see them, uh, but uh, they prove uh, whether uh, the driver's license is authentically yours. Uh, Today we're in 1 John uh, chapter 3. And uh, there are some marks, according to 1 John, that are embedded uh, in you. If you are authentically a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, there are some marks that are embedded in you. Just like those marks on a driver's, on the new driver's license. We've been studying them from 1 John. Actually, interestingly, 1 John chapter 3 contains all five of the marks. All right? Loving deeply, living authentically, obeying faithfully, knowing completely, and believing confidently. Now, uh, in the message today, uh, we're going to look at number five, number four, and number Well, this one is in the wrong order, so this is number two. So uh, these are the two we're going to talk about in the end of chapter uh, three. Uh, But for today, uh, we're just going to look at those uh, last ones, all right? And you're going to see them right in the text, loud and clear. Uh, Do you bear the marks of an authentic Christian? Uh, Today, the end of chapter two, really, and then 1 John chapter three, verses one through ten. Let's take a moment and pray together. Uh, Father, thank you for the privilege of bowing in your presence, and we just uh, humble ourselves before you, Lord, and acknowledge uh, that uh, we want to be fed by your word. Uh, We thank you for the remembrance that we've been able to offer. Where would our lives be without your broken body and your shed blood, the forgiveness of sins? How dark would be the darkness in our lives apart from the light and the life of Christ? And so we worship you and we thank you. And we pray now as we study your word that this would be part of our worship, that the quietness of our spirits, the humility that we show as we see what you would say to us uh, might be greater and greater worship to you. These things we pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's focus on this one first of all. And uh, let me assert uh, this. To believe confidently, I must abide in Jesus' righteousness. Now you'll notice that the last two uh, verses of chapter 2 in 1 John are grouped with chapter 3. Uh, if you have a Bible that's paragraphed, if it's actually published in a paragraph form, you'll see that those last two uh, verses do, I think, best belong with chapter 3. Remember that those things are not inspired in the Bible. Uh, these are, uh, the Bible wasn't written like that, not with paragraphs, not with verses. But um, uh, So uh, for understanding, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 making this point in these two verses, to believe confidently I must abide in Jesus' righteousness. Notice he begins, little children. Again, the term is used only by John, little children. He uses it seven times, three times in this chapter. Uh, Little children, uh, there at the end, uh, verse 28, end of chapter 2. Then down in verse 7, little children. Then over in verse 18, again, so very, very tenderhearted. John's revealing his age. Have you noticed this as you get a little bit older, that you're just more comfortable using terms of endearment with people? 
I find myself just saying to someone, oh, come here, love, thank you for that, or, or calling someone I don't even know, you know, in a term of endearment. I just think the older you get, the more comfortable you are. Don't leave me up here. Do you notice this? Am I right or am I wrong? High five on that? All right. And, and so John, of course, he, he is the last apostle to die. Uh, he, he was very old when he was writing 1 John, and he just had such a tenderness about him. God grant that to us. And so he says, uh, again, verse 28 of chapter 2, little ch- And now, little children, abide uh, in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence before him and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. See, there's the goal is confidence. And when I say confidence, by the way, I don't mean cockiness, all right? I'm not talking about some kind of, you know, chest out, arms back, look at me. He walks into the party like he was walking onto a yacht. I'm not talking about, okay, I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not talking about, everybody know that song? I'm not talking about that, all right? That is absolutely not what he's talking about when he says confidence. It's something very different than that. Something very different. Actually, it's the same word translated in the book of Acts, boldness, openness, candor in the face of opposition. But here it is the idea of the expectation of acceptance, comfort and security. Kathy and I were watching some old family videos the other day We hadn't with our kids. We hadn't seen these in forever. And I'd forgotten that I used to do this, but when our kids were like 18 months old, I used to put them up on top of the fridge and then I would sit on the floor as low down as I could get and I'd go jump. And they would just lean right off the fridge and just choom, right down, and I'd, I caught them every time. Well, there was that one. No, no, I, no, I did. I caught them every time. And, and uh, they had so much confidence, not just physically, but relationally. You know what I mean? No sense whatsoever that I would be anything than loved, protected, taken care of, so, so secure. That's what he's talking about here when he uses the term confidence. Now, to believe confidently... I must abide in Jesus' righteousness to believe confidently. Back to the verse again. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence. When I read that, it reminded me of uh, when I went, went to summer camp. Did some of you all go to summer camp? Did you go to summer camp? One of the crazy things they used to do at summer camp that I remember so well uh, was they used to have these things, inspections. And, and it was a big rallying point for your cabin. And you had to have uh, everything in row and your shoes had to be a certain way. They sweep out the cabin. You had the beds made all perfectly. Stuff we never did this at home. That's why our par- parents probably sent us to camp. And, and uh, you had to learn this and get this right. And there was a, I can remember being at camp one summer for two weeks. The first uh, week, we cared nothing about inspection. We messed things up. We left it on the floor. We were in last place. We didn't care anything about it. We were the laughter and the ridicule. We sort of reveled in the filthiness of our cabin. Because our counselor was very mean and harsh. We didn't want to please him or impress him. We were enduring him. But the second week, we had this counselor that was so amazing and rallied us all around and and, and just got us all fired up about it. And the same kids got so excited about doing the job that they completely refused to do the week before. And I can remember when the inspector would come in and we'd be all just like, just as the first week, did you want the inspector to come during the first week of camp? Was I looking forward to that? No, I was not. But the second week, we could not wait for the guy. We'd be looking out, and is he coming in? And he's just two cabins away, and he's going to be in our cabin soon. And we're so proud of everything. He's going to love what we've done. We're probably going to win the prize. That's what confidence means, all right? That, that when you think about the Lord coming back, you can't wait for him to get here. Confidence. Confidence. Back to verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him. That settle down and be at home in Jesus and abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence in him. Uh, confidence. All right, everyone freeze. So how about if Jesus Christ came back right now? You're like, well, I- I'm going to just need to make a phone call. I just need to make a call and then I'm, re- I'm good to go. Don't we get to make a phone call? I thought you get to make a phone call. Now, this is a different thing, and no, you don't get to make a phone call. You're like, well, I just want to fire off a couple of letters. There's a couple of things I've left undone, and there's a couple of things I'd like to sort out. I've I, I got some money at my house that's not supposed to be there, and, and I, I owe someone an apology, and I, there's a forgiveness I was asked to give that I just couldn't grant. But if I could just, like, just, just give me a half hour. See, that's, that's not the way we're supposed to live our lives. We're supposed to live our lives so that we would be confident, back to the verse, Now, little children, abide in him. Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him 
in shame. The term there, shrink back from him in shame, denotes embarrassment. All right? Like here he comes and you're like, my bunk, it's messy. My shoes, they're, they're, they're in disarray. My, yes, yes, I know. I, I didn't think you were coming so quickly. Don't read that. Don't, I, know, I know I'm not supposed to have that there. And, and shame at his coming. Now, John is writing. Verse 28, here is the key. Jesus, remember, Jesus is the wonderful counselor. All right? Isaiah said. You, you want his inspection and you want to live in such a way that you're ready for it. Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. And, of course, the key to this, it's right there in the text, is to abide in him, to remain in him, to settle down in him, to rejoice in him. What could be wrong if everything is right with Jesus Christ? What could possibly be wrong? I'm ready for him to come back. I won't shrink back and be ashamed at his coming if I'm abiding in him. If I'm walking with him, if I'm living in him, if I'm loving him, if I'm living my life for him, I'm not going to be ashamed when he comes back. I'm going to be like, great, today would be awesome. Let's go right now. You say, but James, who really honestly can live up to that? I mean, what person here who really sees themselves clearly could be like, I'm ready, it's, everything's in order, I'm good to go right now. Well, this is why it's so awesome what he says uh, in the next verse. Notice he says, verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you may sh be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now, uh, this is, this is uh, time for some doctrinal teaching, okay? Don't get this in a lot of churches, okay? But uh, I love you so much, I'm willing to do doctrinal teaching even if you don't realize how important it is. So, uh, everyone take a deep breath. We're about to enter into some doctrinal What is it you're so excited about here at church today? I love this, James. We're about to get some. And the doctrinal teaching that I'd like to give in the message today is about the... Imputed righteousness. Okay, this is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is a biblical doctrine that should cause the heart of every believer to rejoice. The imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let me just read to you what some theologians have written about it, but first a basic definition. The imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ is this, that there's a lens that God looks at you through. If you've turned from your sin and embraced Jesus Christ by faith, God doesn't see you. He sees you through the lens of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That the life that he lived... Your sin was imputed or credited to Jesus Christ, and Christ's righteousness through faith was imputed to you, all right? When God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What does God think of me? He thinks of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is an awesome thing, the imputed righteousness of Christ, that God looks at that lens when he sees you. Now, no matter, if you're in Christ, if you've embraced Christ by faith, if you've received the free gift of salvation... No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how you've failed or fallen this week, God sees you. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, is that good news? That's just, it's just stunning, really, to think about it. He's like, I'm not really the wife that God wants me to be. I'm not really the parent that God wants me to be. I'm not really the financial manager that God wants me to be. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what God sees when he sees you. The imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's an awesome thing. John Calvin, the father of the Protestant Reformation, spoke of the imputation this way. He said, Christ's righteousness, as it alone is perfect, it alone can bear the sight of God. Isn't that awesome? That we in ourselves couldn't even take God's gaze. It's only because of the righteousness of Christ that, that we can, it alone can bear the, the, the gaze or the sight of God. It alone must appear in court on our behalf, covered with this purity the sordidness and uncleanness of our imperfections are not ascribed to us as though they were buried. Jonathan Edwards, a New England pastor who lived in the 18th century, perhaps the finest theologian that ever lived in North America, said this, speaking of the imputed righteousness of Christ. He called it, quote, Christ's perfect obedience shall be reckoned to our account so that we shall have the benefit of it as though we had performed it ourselves. When God looks at your life, he sees your life as though your life is every righteous act of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that is awesome. That is incredible that that's what God thinks about you. No wonder he can keep loving us and keep giving to us and keep showing grace to us. 
the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Charles Hodge, the great Princeton theologian of the 19th century, said this. Uh, picturing a believer as though God were asking the question, why should I forgive you? Here's the answer. The righteousness of Christ in justification has been imputed to the believer. It is set to his account so that he is entitled to plead it at the bar of God. So there I am in court, and God has the gavel, and he's saying, why should I not sentence you to death right now? And my answer is, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Wow. As though it were personally and inherently my own. Wayne Grudem, a seminary professor of mine and really one of the great theologians of this century, says, when we say that God imputes Christ's righteousness to us, it means that God thinks of Christ's righteousness as belonging to us or regards it as belonging to us. He credits it or reckons it to our account. Now listen, loved ones, okay? You don't need some feel-good, felt-need sermon. You need some of this, all right? This is robust teaching. This is a rock upon which you can stand. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And when he comes and tells you that you're not worth much and you're not doing much and you don't account for much and God couldn't possibly love you and look at your life and look at how you've been acting, you have this, all right? Now let's get some scripture behind it. 2 Corinthians 5.21, okay? which says that Jesus Christ became sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You should have that memorized. Next time Satan says, you're not worth much, and look how you're acting, and how could you possibly think you'd go to heaven someday? He became sin for me who knew no sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in him. Philippians 3.8. Paul said that I might be found in him not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Okay, doctrinal teaching. The subject is? Lift up your voice. I just taught you about? All right, back to 1 John chapter 2 then, because that's what he's getting at. How can I possibly not shrink back from him and his coming? I mean, with all due respect to writing the appropriate number of letters and making a couple of phone calls, I don't even know all my sin. I couldn't even possibly calculate the ways that in attitude and action I failed God. I don't, I don't judge myself, Paul says. I, I don't even know myself clearly. How could I possibly think that my own personal inventory would prepare me to stand before a holy God? There is only one way that I will not shrink back from him at his coming, as he says. Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from, back in him, from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, question, do you believe that Jesus Christ is righteous? Hebrews 4.15 says that in him uh, no sin was found, all right? He lived a sinless, perfect life. Otherwise, he couldn't die and pay for your sin and mine. And if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. I have no righteousness of my own. If, I have, if you want to read that in the reverse version, everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Another way of saying that would be, no one is capable of righteousness unless they've been born of him. Another way of saying it would be, if you've been born of him, you practice righteousness. Because one of the things that people begin to say when they hear teaching like I just gave on the imputed righteousness of Christ, uh, they start to get, James, if you preach that, people are going to go insane. People are going to start sinning their faces off. People are going to say, I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I can do whatever I want with my life. You better stop preaching that, James. That sounds like hyper grace. You better watch out what people do with that. Is that true? Not literally true. Notice again. You may be sure. You may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. The people who are truly born again have a decreasing hunger and capacity for sin. Let me give you a couple of reasons why. Number one, because I'm thankful. Because I'm thankful for the forgiveness. I'm thankful for the imputed righteousness of Christ. I sat with a man this week who was such an encouragement to me during a particularly difficult time in my life. It's a man in our church. And I just can't tell you the way he came to me and prayed with me and rallied around me and, and just was so supportive to me. I sat with him now, uh, this is in the past, and I sat with him uh, this week, and we were having lunch. And I said, tell, told him how much, that, how much that meant to me. And I said to him, I would do anything for you. 
I would do anything for you. In my most difficult time, you were there for me. You supported me. You cared for me. You loved me. You encouraged me. I would do anything for you. And see, when you're truly born again by the Spirit of God, that's how you feel about Jesus. You, don't, you, you would never take a teaching on the imputed righteousness of Christ and run off and say, well, I can do whatever I want then. That's not what a real Christian would do. That's not what a person truly born of God would do. A true Christian would be, I'm so thankful, bro. I would do anything for him now for what he's done for me. Here, here's a second way of looking at it. Two reasons why we wouldn't just go off and sin because of grace, because I'm thankful. And, and then secondly, because I, I hate sin. I hate what sin does to me. I hate what sin does to the people I love. I hate what sin did to my Savior. I hate it. I was talking to a pastor a few months back, and he was giving me a hard time because I believe in total abstinence from alcohol. I don't think the Bible requires it, but I believe it's a wise choice. And, and, and I'm going to tell you this. I hate alcohol. I hate it. I hate what it does to people's lives. I hate what it's done to Kathy and my extended family. I just hate it. I just don't see any purpose for it. I don't see it. Well, see, but I'm free. I'm liberated. I can do what I want. Well, fine. Fine. All right. But I hate it. And I hate what it does to people. And I don't want any part of it in my life. And see, when you, when you come to know Jesus Christ, you, you come to the place where you, you hate sin. I hate what it did to me. I hate what it does to people I love. I hate what it did to my Savior. It, that's why you don't need to be concerned. It's not hyper grace. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence. All right? That's the first mark of an authentic Christian. We're just adding more content to it every week as we come back to these marks again and again. And here it is. I believe confidently. I'm not afraid for Jesus Christ to come back, not because I think so highly of myself, but because I have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Does that make me want to keep on sinning? No, it does not. One of the other marks of an authentic Christian is going to prove that in just a moment. In fact, let's go to that right now. To believe confidently, I must abide in Jesus' righteousness. Now chapter 3, verse 1. To know completely, I must hope in the Father's love. To know completely, I must hope in the Father's love. Take a moment and read for yourself verses 1 through 3. Go ahead and do that. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Let's start with the first word. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. The word see there uh, it means to behold, think about it, reflect upon it. Uh, Paul uh, talked about the length and depth and breadth and height of the love of God which passes knowledge. And then, but I, we study this a little bit more. See what kind of love, some translations say, behold what kind of love. Actually, it's a very cool term here. The New King James says what manner of love. NIV says uh, what, uh, how great a love. Actually, literally, this phrase here, when it talks about God's love, it means uh, literally from what country. See, from what country kind of love. Isn't that cool? That's, that's, and they didn't translate it that way, but I mean, I think I totally get that. Don't we talk to people like that? When we see someone do something that's just so outside the box, we're like, for, what planet are you, uh, what planet are you on? Or, or, or we would say to someone, in what universe would, would, could that possibly exist? And that, that's what he's really saying here. When he talks about God's love, he's saying, what planet would you find love like that on? In what universe could someone really love? Behold what manner or see what kind of love the Father has given to us. I love that. So let's just take a second to do that. All right? This has been a service that's been focused on reflection and meditation. Let's take a second and think about the kind of love that God has bestowed upon us. How great it is. How awesome it is. Think about God's love. I was thinking about it a lot this week while you were doing whatever you were doing. And uh, what makes love great? I mean, if we're going to have like a love competition. So I think I'm really probably a fair bit more loving than you are. Well, we'd have to produce evidence, right? And, and what makes love? It's not just a feeling. It's a lot more than a feeling. There'd have to be more. There'd have to be some proof, wouldn't there? Consider these three things. Here's what makes love great. Number one, selflessness. Love that is unselfish is love. If it, love does not seek its own, 1 Corinthians 13 says. So love has to be selfless. You don't tell me I'm in love, I'm in love. Are you selfless? Are you willing to suffer uh, at the expense of that other person? Are you willing to take a lesser position so that that person might have more? Selflessness. And then second uh, characteristic for great love, a duration. All right. How long is this love going to last exactly? 
And we've all seen and been uh, the high school students, I'm in love, I'm in love, set your watch. All right? That won't, that, that won't make it till the end of summer. Okay? And, and uh, so another way that you measure the greatness of love is its selflessness. Secondly, its duration. Okay? And then thirdly, very important, is its knowledge. This is why puppy love doesn't last a lot, because it's not rooted in knowledge. And the fact of the matter is, is that as you get to know someone a little bit better, you find out maybe you won't think as highly of them as you did when you first thought that you knew them. All right, so the greatest possible love, then, is the love that is the greatest selflessness. So how's that going? Think of a, of a human love. Totally selfless. But what human love doesn't have some agenda? Some, I'll love you if you love me, but I don't feel loved by you, so I better pull back into loving myself a little bit more because I'm a little deficient in the love category and I can't let my tank get empty and maybe you take care of your, that, that's, how mar- that's how marriage and relationship breaks down, all right? And on our best days, we're not totally selfless. How's God in that regard? How's God in the selfless category? Uh, hold, hold up the universal symbol for what we do for God. We, we don't complete him. We, we don't, he, he's not like having a good day because we are. He's not like, oh, you know, I mean, God, God takes pleasure in us, all right? But, but we, we don't complete God. We don't, we don't fill him up. He's not lacking anything. Wow, now that I got these people made, things are going to be a lot better around here, okay? And God created us so that he could shower his love upon us, but we do not complete him. And so God's love is totally selfless. Now, secondly, duration. How long does God's love last? Wow. So he's pretty high in that category, right? The Bible says that in eternity past, if you're in Christ, God chose to set his love upon you. God had chosen to set his love upon you in Christ before your great, 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 great grandparents had ever walked the earth. All right? You were known. Ephesians 1, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. If you're in Christ, that is an awesome thing. So God's love, as far as you can go into eternity past, as far as you can go into eternity future, God's love will never change. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing, the scripture says. Neither height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. So selflessness, duration, last of all, knowledge. Is God going to learn something about you this week? He's like, whoa, I don't know what we got ourselves into here. Is that going to happen? Tell me, is it? Okay, so God's love then, uh, just, just we're, we're doing what he says. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. Take some time to think about it. Press your mind down upon it. How great is God's love? Greatest in selflessness. Greatest in duration. Perfect and total knowledge of you, better than you know yourself. But not diminished in love in any way. Wow. To know completely, I must hope in the Father's love. See what kind of love the Father has. I'm going through the text a word at a time. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. Not earned, given. Not loaned. He's not coming back for it. Given. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. That we should be called children of God. So there's his litmus test. Look up here. If you want to know the proof of God's love for you. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called, what, what's the word? Children of God. See, I don't know how you feel about your family, but I feel like like my family's my best thing, all right? My ministry is definitely not my best thing. My, my gifts and abilities are most certainly not my best thing. My stuff is definitely not my best thing. My best thing is my family. I mean, without, would you agree with that? I mean, that's the best thing I have. The best thing I have, without question, is my wife and my children. It's my family. It's, whatever, it's what it's all about. And, and, and my church family. This, this, is, this is, let's hug. Let's hug. My church family. Love to hug the security guys. You're so warm and cuddly. And, and, and okay, this is my family. This is my family. It's my best thing. God gave us his best thing. He said, why don't you all just come be part of the family? Well, you could be one of my children. I'll bring you right in and treat you as my very, very own. Okay, put it all together now. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. Now, a question. Uh, is everyone uh, God's children? 
Because um, Oprah says everyone is God's children. And everyone is not God's children, okay? But uh, every li- liberal news media outlet constantly refers to all of God's children, and songs are written about all of God's children. You go to any secular university campus, of course they don't uh, believe in God, but in some sort of generic uh, reference, uh, they might say that we are all God's children. We are all God's children. And yet everyone intuitively knows that that can't possibly be true. So let's start with worst case scenario. Uh, Was Adolf Hitler one of God's children? Oh, come on, he he murdered six million Jews and countless other people. 38 million people died in the Second World War. But deep down inside there somewhere, there was a spark of goodness. He's not all bad. Uh, No, no, he was a son of the devil. He was not one of God's children. Okay, Um, Saddam Hussein. Uh, One of God's children... How about, how about any uh, evil uh, mass murderer? Just, just the most murderous, child molesting, God's child? Okay, so clearly there's some people that are not God's children. So all that we're really talking about then is where do you draw the line? Where the Bible draws the line is there is none righteous, no, not one. Where the Bible draws the line is, is that he who offends in one point is guilty of all. Where the Bible draws the line is, the wages of sin is death. As we saw on the screen, all we like sheep have gone astray. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3 says. So... Not only are we not all God's children, but everyone born into this world is a son of this world. Not one person who is in the condition they were born in is one of God's children. Not one. Most of the people on your street are not God's children. Most of the people where you work are not God's children. Maybe most of the people in your family are not God's children. How do you become one of God's children? John 1, 12. As many as have received him, speaking of Jesus... As many as have received him, to those he has given the authority to be called children of God. All right, you can go around all you want to and say you're one of God's children, but you don't have the authority to say you're one of God's children unless God says you are. How many people would agree that you're probably not in God's family unless God says you are? You might be able to hang around in the backyard for a little while and fool some people, okay? But uh, the bottom line is you're not part of the family unless God says you are. And God says you're not part of the family unless you've embraced his son, Jesus Christ. If you get the sun, you get everything. If you reject the sun, you get nothing. All right, back to the text. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Nothing we would want to take for granted. That we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. You're like, okay, James, I, I'm, I'm tracking with you. I, I, um, I believe I'm one of God's children through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? But sometimes I don't really feel like I'm one of God's children. I do, I just, it's just not lining up with me in my life and what I'm experiencing. Well, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So if you're getting your feedback from people around you who don't know the Lord, you can just like eh, X that out. Okay? You say, but no, it's more internal. I, I really struggle myself to feel like I'm one of God's children. Verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. But, but here, here's the tension. And what we will be has not yet appeared. Someone said to me recently, why do I act like a person who didn't grow up in a loving family? And why do we sometimes act like we aren't God's children if we've given our life in faith to Jesus Christ? Why do we sometimes act like we're not God's children, like we're not loved, like we don't have this love abiding upon us? Why do I sometimes conduct myself just like any other regular person walking the street, not like someone who's truly forgiven? What's wrong with me? Well, he says it right there in the text. Jot this word down, gap. There's a gap. And sometimes we feel the gap very acutely. That's what he means when he says, what we will be has not yet appeared. What we will be has not yet appeared. 
There's a gap between what I feel and who I am. There's a gap between what I look like and who I am. There's a gap between what I do and who I am. So let me just say this to you. Everybody look up here for a minute. So I was excited to get to this part. Okay? You are, as God's child, you are way better than you feel. You are. And, and you know something else? As God's child, you are way better than what you do. You're not who you do. You're not what you feel. You're not what you look like. Isn't that good news? We are way better than what we look like. Amen? Amen. We are way, way better than what we look like. That was a great spot for an amen. We are, we are way better than what we look like. Amen. We are. We're not what we feel like. We're not what we do. We're not, we're not, we're not what we look like. We're, we're none of these things. All right? There's a gap. Look at the text. I'm just, it's right there. Now it does not yet appear what we, what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that, here it is, when he appears, okay, that's talking about the second coming of Christ, 2 Thessalonians 4 says that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will be caught up together with him in the air, and so we will ever be with the Lord. There's a day coming. It's coming. It's closer than it was yesterday. It's closer than it was last year. It's closer than it was last time we talked, okay? It's getting closer. Everyone say it's getting closer. All right? And when Jesus Christ comes back, the gap between what I feel and what I am, between what I do and what I am, between what I look like, I just look like everybody else, but I'm one of God's children, the gap between what I look like and what I am will all be closed in an instant. What we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. How good is that news? We're going to be like him. I mean, how great is that? We're going to be like him. When Jesus Christ comes back, you're going to be exactly like him. You're going to think the thoughts that he would think and feel the things that he would feel. You're going to understand what he understands. You're going to know what he knows. You're going to be like him. Very cool. Can't wait. This is interesting. Anybody have any idea who Thomas Chisholm is? Here's a picture of him. That looks like my grandpa. Thomas Chisholm. He died the year I was born, 1960. And uh, he lived in the Midwest most of his life. In the later years, he lived in New Jersey. He was an insurance salesman. He's known for a very famous hymn. He wrote it. He wrote over 1,200 poems and hymns in his lifetime. The most famous one is, Great is Thy Faithfulness. But here's one he wrote. We used to sing this growing up. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures Jesus, your perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. I like the third verse. He said, oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit, holy and harmless, patient and brave, meekly enduring cruel reproaches, willing to suffer, others to save. Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Right? This is the longing of a person who truly knows the Lord. All right? This is the longing of a true child of God. I want to be like Jesus Christ. I'm so sick and tired of the gap. I'm so weary of myself and who I am and all of my shortcomings. I'm longing to shed this body and step into eternity and be with the Lord. And in a moment, we'll be like him. The version I memorized is, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. Now, to know the Father completely, I must hope in that. Look up here. This is your hope. This is the hope of the church, the return of Christ. 
that, that I'm going to be like him, that all this is going to be behind me. And you have to make that your hope, not that circumstances are going to change, not that you'll be able to fix this, not that people are going to figure it out, that haven't figured it out, whatever it is that burdens you, not that I'm going to sort out all my finances. The follower of Jesus Christ, my hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. Any place else is misplaced. Where is my hope? In the Lord. Lift up your voice. Where is my hope? To believe confidently, I must abide in Jesus' righteousness. To know completely, I must hope in the Father's love. Now, just quickly through these last verses, they make one point very well. To obey faithfully, I must progress in righteousness. You listen to this message and you say to yourself, you know, James, I don't think I'm doing so great, honestly, in believing confidently. I, I don't know if I'm doing so great in that. I really don't. And, and knowing completely, I, you know, like you said, and really hoping in the Lord... Uh, all right, well, here's the key. The key word is progress. Progress. I must progress in righteousness. This is one of the marks of a Christian. In fact, if I could boil it down to you and say, here's one thing, check this out for sure. You better be making progress. If you claim to be an authentic Christian, you better be making progress. Notice this, verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. The word sin is used six times in this chapter. Isn't it interesting that in writing to Christians, John talks so much about sin. 27 times he mentions the word sin in the book of 1 John. That's the most concentrated teaching in sin on the, in the whole New Testament. Romans uh, uh, mentions it 60 times, but of course it's much longer. Uh, John mentions it half as much again more than Romans. Hebrews mentions sin 29 times, but John mentions, mentions it twice as often. This is it, the most concentrated teaching on the biggest problem, even in the life of a Christian. The word sin means to miss the mark. Lawlessness is the presence of sin rampaging. The Antichrist is called in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, the man of lawlessness. Sin unchecked, unconverted by Christ. It's just out of control. It's just spiraling. You're worse in your 40s than you were in your 30s. You're worse in your 60s than you were in your 40s. It's getting worse. You say, well, I've talked a few things in you, but your attitude's worse, and you're more self-righteous, and you think you don't need God. To obey faithfully, I must progress in righteousness. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Speaking of Jesus, verse 5, you know that he appeared to take away sins. You know that, right? You know that he appeared to take away sin, right? I love John. He's talking so personal. You know that, right? You know that he appeared to take away sin, right? And, and, and notice the rest of the verse, and you know in him there is no sin, right? So if we're following Jesus, he came to take care of the sin problem, both eternally and in my life right now. And you know there's no sin in him, right? So if we claim to be following him, there better be less and less of it in us, because you know he came to take away sin, right? And you know that in him there is no sin, right? Okay, that's verse 5. You know that he appeared to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. If, if you're in Christ, you don't keep doing the same things over and over. You're changing, you're growing, you're progressing. Your attitude is better, your actions are better, your heart is warmer. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Because if you do keep on sinning, if you have patterns of sin in your life that you're a slave to, that have never been broken, never been diminished, no improvement of ever, any kind, not saved, not saved, you say, James, I'm a bigger liar than I was 10 years ago. Not saved. I'm more caught up in, in lust than I was. Not saved. <clears throat> Not saved. I'm not talking about a bad week. I'm talking about a pattern of weeks and months and years. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. But, but, but look, this isn't like, stop sinning. <laughs> Notice how tender he is. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness, whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil's been sinning from the beginning. Look, you can't be in two families, okay? You're either becoming more like God or you're becoming more like the devil. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You know why he came, right? To put away sin. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, sins habitually, keeps on sinning. If you're born again, if you're saved, 
You have a growing pattern of righteousness. You're obeying more and more faithfully. Write down the key word. You're making progress, increasingly so. Verse 10, or pardon me, verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. You're in the family now. He has been born of God. By this it is evident. It's a mark. Here's a mark. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Love is such a big category. It has to wait till next week. All right? We're going to get to that. Love is the summation of all of it. We're coming to that. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this uh, really deep passage in your word. And we want to be those who believe confidently. Thank you for the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Thank you that the lens that God the Father sees us through is Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we can know you more completely. Thank you that we can hope in your love, so great the love you've bestowed upon us. Cause that to be our hope and our future. And cause us to rightly examine our life and see if we are progressing in righteousness. I want to be a more godly man. I want my life to be more honoring to God. I want my actions to be more pleasing to the Lord. I want to bear the marks of a true disciple. And so, Lord, I know I can't do this on my own. You are the one. You alone can make me whole. You alone can do this work in my heart. And so I yield to it afresh. Right now, I do. Keep changing me. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 